morning. Well, happy Valentine's Day. You know, today I was thrilled that Mark asked me to preach because when he called, he said that I got to start out and kick off your Lenten series and that he was going to do this special on six spiritual disciplines. And he said, well, Tina, which one do you want to do? And I thought about it for a quick two seconds and I thought, uh, praise and worship. Does anybody know me here? Some of you, <laughs> some of you know me quite well and uh, it didn't take me too long to figure that out. So I called him right back and said, well, praise and worship is what I want to preach on. And he said, absolutely, you can do that. So this morning, as you know, Julie Cast is here ministering with me and with us. She's ministering and worshiping through this canvas. And I've asked her to be up here with me because this is just as important as all worship that's happening. And it is just as important as the spoken word. As a matter of fact, even if we didn't hear the spoken word from a mouth, God is speaking through the canvas. So I am delighted to be watching and I hope for those of you who are visual uh, people are blessed by this as well today. So I want to start us out and I want to invite each one of us to think of what it would be like to praise in the throne room of God and to quiet our hearts now. We've been praising now with these high energy songs, but I'm gonna just ask you to quiet your hearts right now and let us pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for the privilege of coming together in corporate worship and to be able to sit together and to worship you. Lord, we ask that you illuminate your word for us this morning in ways that we've never seen it before. Holy Spirit, continue to flow in and through this room and each one of our hearts. And let the words of my mouth and the meditations of our heart be more than pleasing to you this morning, God. We do all that we do to glorify you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. I'm going to read Revelation 4. 1 through 11 out of the New King James Version. I know that that seems a little old school, but it's just what I prefer. So here we go. After these things I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, Come up here, and I will show you things which you must take place after this. Immediately I was in the spirit, and behold, a throne set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And he who sat on there was like a jasper and a sarges stone in appearance. And there was a rainbow, and around the throne in appearance, with like an emerald. And around the throne were twenty-four thrones, and on the thrones were saw, I saw twenty-four elders clothed in white robes, and they had crowns of gold on their heads. And from the throne proceedings lightnings and thunderings and voices, seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne, which are the seven lamps and the seven spirits of God. Before the throne there was a sea of glass like crystal, and in the midst of the throne and around the throne were four living creatures full of eyes in front and in back. The first living creature was like a lion, the second living creature like a calf, the third living creature had a face like a man, and the fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. The four living creatures, having six wings, were full of eyes around and within, and they do not rest day or night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is yet to come. Whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever, and they cast their crowns before the throne, saying, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Now, I was talking to a pastor group I uh, lead in here in Ventura County, friends of mine, and I said, who here preaches out of the book of Revelation? And all of them said, never. We never do it. And you know why? Because it is just a plethora of genres. It's a letter, it's prophecy, it's apocalyptic, it's eschatology. 
So apocalyptic, we know that what that is, right? That's like Independence Day. That's the doomsday, the last day we're going to go. And then eschatology is when Jesus comes again. So that's all of our theology wrapped up in this one book. And people generally stay away from it. And I would say this, Revelation is a wonderful and yummy book to be taught in a Sunday school series over 12 weeks. But today we're going to focus on one thing. Worship. Just worship. And so we begin with our first part of this. What is the book of Revelation? What is John the Apostle telling us in this book? It's theocentric. Theos, God-centered. It is God-centered. God is in the center of everything here. We have four living creatures with these crazy faces and the wings, right? I mean, this is like some kind of a scene out of Disneyland or perhaps what I've heard when people went to Woodstock back in the day. I don't know. I've only heard. I asked somebody here earlier, did you been to Woodstock? No, I was too young, Tina. So, but I've heard stories or perhaps that rabbit trail down Alice in Wonderland. But it certainly sounds like that, doesn't it? The imagery that we see in this book. But regardless of that, we see a creative God. We see everything as theocentric. It's all about God for living creatures and 24 elders. And we see the Sargestone stone and the splendor of God is all focused around God. It's theocentric. Everything is around God and worshiping God. And then the four living creatures start out with what we call the five hymns of praise. That is key in the Revelation 4 package and within this whole scripture. The first two come in Revelation 4 and the rest come in Revelation 5. So we see the four living creatures starting us out with the first hymn of praise and they say what? Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is yet to come. Now where have we heard that before? We've heard that with Ezekiel 1.1, haven't we? Those crazy visions, the old prophet, he's the, one of the major prophets, and he talks about the wheels, and then he talks about the four living creatures and the heads, and it's the lion and the man and the lamb and, and the eagle, right? And with, with all of the wings and all of this great imagery that we see, he talks about this vision and this splendor of God because he also is theocentric, God-centered. We see this also in Isaiah 6.5 where Isaiah goes to the throne room of God also in his vision. And he sees the same thing. It's the same four living creatures. He calls them seraphim. So here we have the Apostle John talking about the same four creatures worshiping at the throne room of heaven and giving us this first phrase, this first hymn of praise. Then we move into our second hymn of praise. You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. So here now we have seen the 24 elders are gathering together with the four living creatures. And what do they do? They give God glory and honor, and they fall down. And as I was preparing this message. I really spent a lot of time with this because I thought, you know, we talk a lot about worshiping God. And we, we sing these beautiful songs about giving him honor and glory and praise and worship, but I think sometimes we really don't know what that means. We can't translate those ethereal type words into actions. How do we worship God in his throne room? We give him glory. Doxia. Doxa. It's to give him the ultimate honor. We honor God. Honor, the word that John is using here in the Greek, it actually was a word at that time that was used in the Roman culture. This book was written around 81 AD. The Christians were being persecuted. And at that time, this word honor would be something like a, um, a Roman senator would be, would be given. Reverence and honor and respect. 
So we would give God reverence and honor and respect. John uses a word that relates more to that community of culture at the time. Then we see the 24 elders doing something else. They fall down. They literally fall down. And as I researched this, they actually fall. They go from one elevation to another elevation. It's literal. They literally, boom, to do. They go from one elevation in their worship to another elevation. And then they cast their crowns. And I've heard so many people talk about crowns, how, some, how we get these crowns of glory and these levels and so forth. But this passage is talking about crowns being pride and wealth. How each of these 24 elders, they take their pride and their wealth and those things that matter to them and they cast. Casting in this way is they, care, they throw it without care. Like cast your cares upon the Lord and he will care for you, Jesus says. So they cast it out on God's throne, letting it all out so that God is the center. So whatever is keeping them from God and keeping them from having God as the center of their life, they're casting it down. And they physically go from one elevation to another and physically cast it down so that they can worship him. Worship, proskuneo. I love this word. It's my favorite word in the whole Bible. And why? Because what it means is to lay prostrate before God. This is the scene that's looping right now in heaven as we sit here. The seraphim are singing. The four living creatures are singing. The 24 elders are looping this exact thing. They're falling down. They're going from one elevation to another elevation. They're taking their crowns, their pride, their wealth, whatever is separating them from the center of having God as their center, and they're literally throwing it down without a care at God's throne. And then they worship. They lay prostrate before God. They literally lay prostrate. They lay this way and worship God. And they continue to do this. And they loop this worship over and over. This is amazing. This is worship. This is worship in the throne room of heaven. And this is going on right now as we worship here along with all of these angelic beings worshiping in the throne room. Now the second part of this passage is that God created all things. So God created all things. Now John is pulling this in right from Genesis 1, isn't he? In the beginning God created heaven and earth. So this is the full, this is the full Bible. God created heaven and earth. John 1, 1 said, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. Jesus Christ was with God in the beginning in Genesis 1, 1, and God created heaven and earth. And this passage tells us right here on our first hymn of praise that God was there and that he created. And then it goes on to say that by your will, by God's will, they exist and were recreated by his will. That's the third petition out of the Lord's Prayer. Let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. John is preaching God's word, almost in its entirety, just in this one section. He's taking us through that journey from Genesis, through the old prophets. He's taking us through Jesus. And he's going to continue to take us on this journey now as we look at the third hymn of praise. So Revelation 5, we're going to bump into there just for these last three phrases. And what happens now? They the four living creatures and the 24 elders, they turn their attention now just from God into the Lamb, the Lamb who was slain. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. And they fell down. They went from a high place to a low place. And they said, you are worthy. 
They said the lamb is worthy. What does worthy mean? It means that he is set apart and he is sacred. He is set apart by God and he is sacred. And that is that third hymn of praise. In our fourth hymn of praise, they also begin to talk about the Lamb of God. But this is different. What we had before was we had sort of a, a small lens view. First we were talking about just the lens on God. It's theocentric and it's just focusing on God and praising God. And then you pulled back a little bit and then you saw the lamb sitting with God and worshiping God. Now we're going to pull back this lens even further and guess who's there? Now there's thousands, 10,000 times, 10,000 of angels, the saints who are there now worshiping along with the four living creatures and the 24 elders and all of the saints and all of the angels are now worshiping. And they are now worshiping with our fourth hymn of praise. And they say, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. This is worship. This is worship in a mega church. <laughs> this is a mega, mega, mega church. And this is happening on a continual loop. So in our fifth hymn of praise, it's as if to, to sort of encapsulate this. We have two for God and two for the Lamb, and now this fifth one is going to wrap them up. The victory has been won through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, the Lamb who was slain and who now sits with God. Right? So as the final act, all of these beings come together and declare blessing and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. You know, I know that praise is hard and difficult for some people. I was thinking about praise and how worship and praise, I was so excited to, to say this is what I wanted to. And even this morning when I was listening to the music, and I'm just, if you know me, you just know I can't keep still. Music moves me. Music moves me. Worship moves me. And this is what we're actually called to do. We're called to worship and praise and do this action of moving and this proscuneo, this laying down. And, and I was thinking about a conversation I had with Richard Harris, who's my neighbor. And I thought, this is so appropriate for some people who don't actually like music. And Richard said to me one day, a while ago, he, I said, where are you going? He says, oh, I'm going to my history club. I don't know if some of you are in his history club. And I said, a history club? Ugh. <laughs> he said, put a fork in my eye. That sounds horrible. <laughs> he goes, no, Tina. And he started talking. He said, it's fantastic. We talk about history and U.S. history and, you know, world history. I said, I bet Dave Wilkinson's in that club, isn't he? <laughs> sure enough, he was. And, and I said, oh, that's just awful. Why would you do something like that? And he just lit up. He was so excited. And I realized, as excited as I am about music and the arts and creative aspects of, of life, I realized that perhaps not everybody is like that. Perhaps people think it's like putting a fork in your eye, you know? And so I began to think about today like this as well. Perhaps worship is a stretch for people. Perhaps it's a stretch. Perhaps it's hard to think about it. And, and my hope then would be to think we want to be obedient to God because God has made us to worship him. He's made us to praise him. He's made us to, to worship him in these ways. He's made us to, to fall down. He wants to be theocentric. That is the basis of our Reformed faith, is that God is the beginning and the end. He is everything for us. He is who begins us and who ends us, and everything in between. And he is where the power is. The power. They have the power. Oh, the lights came on. Wonderful. The power. It's a simple reminder 
this light here. It's the dunamis. So perhaps some of us are sitting here and we think, you know what, I don't really like to worship. I don't understand it. It doesn't resonate with me. I'm not crazy about music. It doesn't do much for me. But then I would say we need to ask for more of the power of God, the dunamis. Because when we do plug into God's power, God is going to give us the heart for worship. Because I cannot imagine that the 24 elders and the four living creatures, that they do this looped day in, day out, day in, day out, that they're doing it because it's, a, it's punishment to them. It cannot be like sticking a fork in their eye. <laughs> Otherwise, they wouldn't be able to do it. So God must be giving them the power, the, the source, the dunamis. God is giving them the grace and the ability to be able to have this desire to want to worship him in this way. It's like this beautiful choreography happening. And I believe God wants us to join in with him. That that's what we're called to do, is to join in with the praises of the heavens. And as we see in this last, this last fifth stanza, the people who are praising are in the heavens, on the earth, under the earth, and in the seas. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord, is what the psalm says. We're created to praise. We're created to worship. I think that when we think about worship, first and foremost, that we make God theocentric, that he's the center, that we literally cast our crowns. Whatever's separating us, we need to do that. We need to cast it down. If it's our pride or our wealth, whatever's keeping us between us and God as being the center, then we need to do that. We need to make him the center of everything from the mundane to the spectacular in our lives. Because he wants to be in the center of all that we are. We want to do it out of obedience. We want to worship him. And we want to glorify him. And how are you doing over there, Missy? Are you about done? Or do you want to talk about it? So I wanted to save a little time here at the end to have Julie talk to us about her painting. And I did not ask for that, but I'm going to get one. Thank you. Hold on. Thank you, darling. Is this on? Thank you. And I'd like to ask you to just share a little bit with us of what you're sort of hearing and what your painting means. Okay, well, what keeps coming to me as I'm doing this, and um, actually kind of the first thought this morning when I woke up praying about today was where it says in Psalms, be still and know that I am God. And so much of the time we're not still. We're running around, we're doing all kinds of things. And I kind of, when I think of what the throne room in heaven looks like, to me it's almost, it's like a very calm place in many ways, full of energy, but it talks about the crystal and the sea of glass and all these things, and, and rainbows, and it's not like real, real bright, it's not, it's, it just seems more peaceful when you're still. It's peaceful stillness. You, know, you see a lot of pictures of the throne room and there's bright colors and there's all kinds of activity running around and all that stuff. And I don't know, for me it's more peaceful, but such an energy and such a presence of the Lord. Who's such, the Lord himself is so magnificent that he doesn't even have a form. He's just energy and love. Beautiful. Thank you so much That's for being here. Was. Thank you. We also are going to get to have Julie come back second service and she's going to paint a second painting, part two. part two, that will be, instead of the throne room, perhaps it's going to switch to the lamb. Um, so that'll be kind of exciting. Thank you. Thank you. Okay.
Lord, we will adore you. We will worship you. We will praise you. And we will seek to bring you honor and glory because you are worthy. You are worthy, oh God. We thank you, God. We thank you for your presence. And we thank you that you are the center of all who we are. Amen. So that song, Revelation song, I would like to give you homework because you do have a Lenten study for the week. I encourage you all to look that up on YouTube because the words are right out of the book of Revelation 4 and 5. And if you sing it, you might actually start to memorize it. And perhaps God will minister to you even during the week. And you will worship Him in the mundane and the spectacular in all areas of your life. Now, after the benediction, if you'd like to come over for prayer with Pastor Janet, we welcome you to do so. And we'd love to have fellowship outside. And I know you know there's other things going on that I might not know, but we welcome you to stay and speak to one another and love one another. And it was so nice to be with you today. Now receive your benediction. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the community of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.